Today I'm out in the forest with the biggest Jeep ever conceived. This is the all new Jeep Grand Wagoneer. If this isn't big enough for you, stay tuned because there's gonna be a Wagoneer L and a Grand Wagoneer L that's gonna be even bigger than the model I'm taking a look at. This is not just the biggest Jeep ever produced, it's arguably the first time that the Chrysler group of companies has produced a full-size SUV that was the same size as everybody else's full-size SUVs. The original Dodge Durango, the original Wagoneer, etc. They weren't as big as competitive vehicles, but that's not the case with the Wagoneer. This is positively huge. Now, I should address one thing right up front. First, is this a Jeep or is it just a Wagoneer? Well, to be perfectly honest, it's a Jeep. It sold at a Jeep dealer. The press release mentions Jeep 26 times, and there are, in fact, six Jeep logos on the vehicle. Jeep is calling Wagoneer a sub-brand, however, so we don't have a Jeep logo on the front. Instead, they're discreetly tucked away, one in each headlamp module, one for some reason on each side view mirror, one in each tail lamp, and apparently I can't count, there is a seventh that's over here on the windshield. I've always found the controversy, or perhaps faux controversy, around whether or not this is a real Jeep a little bit silly. Because over the last 40 or 50 years or so, ever since Jeep created the very first Wagoneer and the first Grand Cherokee, they've been cultivating a bit of a split personality. Off-road capability on one side, definitely defined by the Jeep Wrangler, and luxury, now defined by the Wagoneer and Grand Wagoneer. Also, of course, the very top end trims of that Grand Cherokee, which can get more expensive than some flavors of the Wagoneer and Grand Wagoneer. The two most critical things to know about the Wagoneer and Grand Wagoneer are that Grand does not mean bigger like it does with the Cherokee, so this is not a bigger Wagoneer. That would be the Wagoneer L and the Grand Wagoneer L. The next thing to know is that neither version really competes with base versions of a Chevy Tahoe or something like a Nissan Armada, the least expensive full-size SUVs in America. Jeep was really targeting the Yukon Denali, the Cadillac Escalade, and the Lincoln Navigator with their full-size SUVs. There are some models that start below $60,000, but the vast majority of the Wagoneer and Grand Wagoneer lineup is well over $70,000, well into the six figures by the time you're talking about top-end models. So definitely a very different kind of vehicle. And that's really obvious outside and inside the Wagoneer and Grand Wagoneer, where we find parts that are built to a higher standard because the average MSRP is higher allowing them to spend a bit more money on the inside. With an overall length of 214.7 inches long, this is easily the biggest SUV the brand has ever made. And again, if you want something even longer, there's going to be the L version at 226.7 inches long. The short wheelbase version is about four inches longer than an Escalade or a Navigator, but the long wheelbase version is going to be just a hair shorter than the Cadillac. From this angle, you can see the most controversial styling element of the Wagoneer and Grand Wagoneer. It's the body color painted pillars. For some reason, and every time I see one, especially when it's in silver, I can't help but thinking of a fork and its tines just pointing up towards the sky. Let me know if you see that as well, and let me know what you think about body-colored pillars. Are they a good idea? Are they a bad idea? Is it simply because this is an SUV? Because, of course, sedans have had body-colored pillars for a long time. The boxy theme continues out back where we find a very vertical hatch. It's really accentuated by the fact that the windshield wiper is here rather than mounted up top on some sort of large module like we find in GM's full-size SUVs. Probably the big reason for that is that the glass does not open separately from the hatch. You just have to open the hatch if you want to get into the cargo area. I think that's a bit of a misstep because the glass opening separately is a very practical touch, and it's something that's dying on a lot of SUVs and crossovers in the US. Down here, we have full LED tail lamp modules with progressive red LED turn signals. You'll find the two inch hitch receiver right there under that panel, dual exhaust tips tucked up under the bumper. Under the hood, we find a positive cornucopia of engines. Some are new for 2023, and some are technically new for, I guess you could say, 2022 and a half. The short wheelbase Wagoneer is going to start with a 5.7 liter V8 engine, producing 392 horsepower, 404 pound-feet of torque. That engine is very clearly related to the one that we find in the Ram 1500, the Jeep Grand Cherokee, etc. Then we have this engine, which is standard in the Grand Wagoneer. It's a 6.4 liter V8 engine, producing 477 horsepower, 455 pound-feet of torque. This is loosely based on the 392 SRT engine that we've seen in a wide variety of different Stellantis products. If you get the long wheelbase version, then that is going to come standard with the new 3-liter twin-turbo inline-six engine. That's going to produce 420 horsepower, 468 pound-feet of torque. 
the long wheelbase Grand Wagoneer is going to get a different version of that same brand new 3 liter twin turbo, producing a whopping 510 horsepower and 500 pound feet of torque. If you are lucky enough to get the order book just right, you can actually get that 510 horsepower engine in the short wheelbase Grand Wagoneer for 2022. Most likely, although we don't have confirmation for this just yet, in 2023, the short wheelbase Wagoneer is likely going to be available with the lower horsepower 3 liter twin turbo, or those twin turbo engines could become standard. Some of that is a little unknown at the moment. It's likely that over the next few years, the 3 liter twin turbo engine is going to replace most or all of the V8 engines in the Jeep, Dodge, and Chrysler portfolios. So if you want to get your hands on a big 6.4 liter V8 in your next SUV, you might want to act quickly, and you're not going to find it at all in the long wheelbase version. At least partially thanks to the body on frame design, this has a significantly higher tow rating than we find in the three row Grand Cherokee L, even though you can get the same 5.7 liter V8 engine under either hood. Wagoneer towing tops out at 10,000 pounds for the short wheelbase version with the 5.7. Because of the added weight of the 6.4 liter engine and some of the other goodies going on inside, towing capacity will drop down depending on the engine choice and the trim level you choose. If you get the long wheelbase version with the 3.0 liter twin turbo engine and 420 horsepower, you'll tow 9,850 pounds with that model in rear wheel drive format. Also, that same tow rating with this 6.4 liter V8. If you get the 510 horsepower version of the 3 liter twin turbo, it drops down even further down to 9,450. But any way you slice it, these are extremely high towing capabilities for a full-size SUV in the US. The vast majority of the full-size competition tops out at around 8,000 pounds, and a lot of those top-end tow ratings are optional. They're standard over here on the Wagoneer and Grand Wagoneer. If you are a frequent tower, then you should know that this is going to tow more like a half ton truck because of its body on frame design, although the frame is not the same frame that we find in the Ram 1500. This model Grand Wagoneer is a Series 2, so we have a million way adjustable driver seat. You can extend the thigh cushion, inflate the side bolsters, change the curvature of the seat back, inflate the back bolster separately. There's a four way adjustable electric headrest available front seat massage, and two position memory. The passenger seat also has the same range of motion as the driver's seat, and then the driver also gets a memory linked powered tilt telescopic steering column and power adjustable pedals. The designers put most of the seat controls on the front doors, although some of them are in the touchscreen infotainment system. That likely allowed the designers to give you a slightly wider driver's seat since you don't need to get your hand in this area. It also gave them the opportunity to give you a big illuminated Grand Wagoneer logo in addition to the Wagoneer sill. You can get the Wagoneer or Grand Wagoneer as a seven or an eight passenger vehicle. So two up front, two or three in the middle, three always in the way back. This is the seven seat version. So we have large captain's chairs here with a pretty decent amount of recline to them. The seat bottom cushion also moves around a little bit to help change the angle of the seat. With just over 120 inches of combined legroom, there is a ton of room inside. This front seat's all the way back in its tracks. Over here on this side, I have plenty of legroom left, about four and a half inches or so. This is the kind of vehicle where if you didn't have this rear seat entertainment system installed, it would be pretty easy to put rear facing child seats back here. This center console is enormous because of course the Grand Wagoneer and Wagoneer are very wide based around theoretically a approximately half ton truck footprint. So this center console and the front center console are very pickup truck normal. If you have a family with child seat aged children, you're probably going to want the Wagoneer or Grand Wagoneer over the competition, if for no other reason but because these second row seats allow you to leave a child seat latch anchored into place or booster seat and still tilt and slide this seat forward to get access to the third row. This is the only option in this segment that allows this particular feature, and it works not just on the driver's side but also over here on the passenger side. The power second row mechanism definitely makes getting into the third row easier, but you should know that for some children, moving these seats back into place could be a little difficult because they are a little on the heavy side. With the front seat all the way back in its tracks, this second row seat comfortably adjusted for me at six feet tall. You can see I have about five inches of leg room left. There is a ton of room in here. And this is a three person bench, but it's gonna be a lot more comfortable than the, some of those smaller crossovers that have a three row bench at the back. Certainly more comfortable than something like a Toyota Highlander. Also, tons and tons of headroom back here. This is one of the roomiest third rows period outside a minivan. My hair is just barely brushing the ceiling. You can see I can put my whole hand right in there. The third row is also powered in this model, but if I put it back, then my head does touch this area right back here around this center seat belt. The seat belt pops out for the center 
seating position. The center seat position itself is pretty comfortable and you could fit three adults across the back if you needed to because the shoulder belt module for the center seat position is over here on the passenger side of the vehicle, not the driver's side. I have a little bit more headroom in this center seat position than I did in this outboard seat just because of that module. Passengers in the third row get a softly padded outboard armrest, two cup holders, air vents. Those are the power controls for the third row. We get some USB charge only ports. And then on the driver's side, we have latch anchors on this side only, none for the other two seating positions, but all three do have top tether anchors. And here's a better view of that seat belt bulge in the ceiling. You can see it's really a prominent bulge on the passenger side of the vehicle. Cargo capacity is a solid reason to buy this over the competition. I was able to fit four 24 inch roller bags here just barely with the third row seats in their more upright position. If they're reclined like this one over here, then I couldn't fit that many and I was really just limited to two. But either way, this is more than you can get in the rest of the competition, especially something like the new Toyota Sequoia. Its cargo area is really quite small because it has a hybrid system standard, which trades fuel economy for a bit of cargo practicality in the back. Now, if you want the bigger wheelbase version, the Wagoneer L and Grand Wagoneer L, then this cargo area expands to over 40 cubic feet. Because as I said before, the third row seats do not move backwards. And that's what we see in Ford's full-size SUV and the Lincoln full-size SUV. But in the Cadillac, we get more cargo room and extra third row room. So depending on your needs as far as leg room in the back and cargo room, that might skew you to one decision or the other. Taller shoppers beware, this hatch does not open as high as you might think. I'm six feet tall, I have about an inch of clearance. So if you're six one or over, be prepared to be hitting your head on the hatch. But shorter drivers are probably gonna like the fact that the button to close the hatch is over here on the side, not on the hatch itself. On the other side, we have the power controls for the second row and third row seats, which are powered. And under this surprisingly thickly padded cargo area floor, we have a little bit of additional storage space. This is also where we have a place to put the cargo rails if you don't want them hanging out on the roof. This little section, there's a jack, and then underneath the vehicle, we have a spare tire. The cargo cover is not a roller cover. It's one of these sort of uh, spring-loaded slinky-like things that I could just never figure out exactly how to store under the floor. With a twist, it has some hard rubbery ends and those lock in the side like so. And then we have this strap right here that snaps around the base of the rear headrest. I suppose that makes sense since the third row does power recline. And if you power fold the third row, it'll pop off on its own or just pull out of those little things so that way it doesn't damage anything. As we look around the interior, keep in mind that this is a Grand Wagoneer Series 2, so definitely not a base trim. However, I have to say that even the base Wagoneer is pretty nicely done, likely because of its higher starting price versus some of the competition. This particular model has this large two-pane moonroof, a big one just over the second row seats, and then that separate one for the third row. We also have well-integrated manual side shades for the second row, and as you can see, lots of ambient lighting going on in here. As this model is obviously a direct competitor to the Escalade Navigator, we have lots of microphones for the active noise cancellation system in here, and that bigger item in the middle, that's a surround speaker. We also find one over that second row lap area there, but these speaker grills don't feel quite as premium as the ones that we find in the Escalade. On the front seat back, the metal tag says Series 2, that's the trim level that we're in. The headrests are four-way electric adjustable, then there's a butterfly adjustment as well. The front seats are both heated and ventilated, and again, tons of adjustment going on with those seats. Personally, I think this interior looks better with the wood trim that's available, but if you'd rather have metal trim, you can get that as well. Again, more of those ambient lighting strips running right there on top of the door plenty of soft touch and premium materials. This entire door panel all the way down to the bottom is soft touch material. The only hard plastics are the ones that you'll find on the inside of that storage cubby at the bottom of the door. You can see the Macintosh logo for the Macintosh audio system. And again, lots of soft touch materials down here on the lower portion of the dashboard, all soft touch all the way down. The dashboard design changes a little bit depending on whether or not you get the passenger side LCD. I will go ahead and turn it on. You can barely see it on the camera because there's a prism in that cover so the driver cannot see it while the vehicle is in motion. This does not do as many things as I would like. It does allow you to do some navigation stuff. It allows you to mirror the screens in the rear, control the screens in the rear for the kids, etc. But you cannot CarPlay, for instance, on two screens. I really wish you'd be able to do that. Either CarPlay a different source or something along those lines have multiple screens with CarPlay because that does support it. We then have another trim section here. Again, you can get wood trim pretty big glove compartment right here, although I was not able to fit an 11 inch tablet computer inside. Moving across to the middle of the dashboard, we find two large air vents on either side of this large touchscreen LCD. 
If you're not a fan of touch controls, watch out because there are quite a few in here. You'll find the controls for the seat heating and ventilation on either side of this touchscreen LCD. Interesting twist, the icon is not the touch sensitive portion. It's actually inboard a little bit from there on either side. So certainly keep that in mind if you're stabbing around. I've seen some reviews complain about the responsiveness of the touch control. It's simply because they're stabbing in the wrong location, which did take me a while to figure out. In the middle, we have this large touchscreen LCD section with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, but you can see it doesn't occupy the entire screen. There is still a portion of that screen down below. Interacting with this software is a little bit less snappy than the system that we find in the Cadillac Escalade, but this is significantly more responsive than the system that we find currently in the Lincoln Navigator. Also more responsible versus Ford's big LCD infotainment system that we're starting to see in a number of their electric vehicles. There are apps that can be added to the system via the App Store, and then there are also some integrated apps right there. The interesting thing about this version of Uconnect, which is what they call the infotainment software, is that one central processor is controlling all the screens in the vehicle, and there are a ton of screens. There's a screen over there for the passenger, there's the infotainment screen, there is that screen below which we're going to take a look at in a bit, there's the large LCD instrument cluster, there's a screen between the rear passenger seats for their climate controls, and then of course those rear seat entertainment screens as well. But moving back up front, we have some physical climate control toggles. We then have a screen for the climate control. But because not all Wagoneers have that screen, you'll also find a third set of climate controls up here on this screen. And really, that is kind of the peculiar twist with Uconnect 5 and these two screens here, is that they're doing basically exactly the same thing. So over here on seats, we have the same thing as seats down there. Over here on massage, same thing as massage up there. Down here again, rear, up here rear. If you're wondering why they bothered, it's primarily so that way you can be doing one thing up here and then something different down here, which you couldn't do without the screen. So for instance, if you wanted to control your seat massage, or if you want to control the rear climate control where you're doing something else up top, it gives you that option. You can also simply fold it out of the way. It will automatically turn off, open to reveal that large storage cubby down there. It has a Qi wireless charging mat. It's blinking because my phone's not quite on it. We then have lots of USB inputs, four that integrate with the system, two back there for the rear entertainment system, and then an HDMI input for that passenger LCD screen. We have another row of touch buttons down here, auto brake hold, lane departure warning, etc., parking sensors, tow haul, the autonomous parking system, and a button to turn on and off that passenger display. Then we have a toggle for the air suspension, a rotary shifter, toggle for the drive mode, an option for four low that is a touch button, and then hill descent control that button right there. Behind that we have storage area on the side, two large cup holders there in the middle. Again, I like the model with wood trim a little bit better. In here, between the front seats, we have a slider top where you can store your utensils, car key, things like that. And then over there, we have some USB charge only ports. As you'd expect out of a large vehicle, opening that up gives us access to a large storage area or a cooling compartment, which is what this vehicle has. Over on the driver's side, we find a large LCD instrument cluster. This is interestingly not standard. There is a smaller one on the absolute base model. This display is highly configurable. You can rotate through a ton of different screens with various readouts, extra gauges, etc., trip computer readouts, also a full map navigation display if you want. This will work with the turn-by-turn -turn directions for the built-in system. We can scroll through some off-road pages with off-road information, trailer towing information, audio information, vehicle messages that would let you know if something's wrong, and then settings as well. This is how you would control the heads-up display in the vehicle. You control the LCD via the buttons on the left side of the steering wheel. These are real buttons rather than simply touch buttons. And then this button is the one that swaps between the two different views. There's also a phone hang up and pick up button, leather wrapped airbag cover. Again, another Grand Wagoneer logo there. On this side, we have the controls for the adaptive cruise control system, and then a gear limit button toggle rather than paddles on the back. I really wish they'd given us paddles instead of these. There are no infotainment buttons on the face of the steering wheel because they're on the back of the steering wheel. So we find track up down on the left side, volume up down on the back of the right side of the steering wheel. The steering wheel itself has a slight flat bottom, kind of a grip right there, sport grips up top, and it's not as thickly rimmed as some of Chrysler's steering wheels in the past. So especially the SRT wheels, they're definitely thicker than this. Now my preference is towards a thicker wheel, but let me know what you think about that down there in the comment section. If you're looking for the SUV with the best exhaust note, it is definitely gonna be this 6.4 liter V8 engine. This is also one of the swiftest. 5.6 seconds zero to 60 in this model versus 5.9 to six seconds approximately in most versions of the Navigator and six to 6.1 in the Escalade. Of course, if you want the ultimate exhaust note and the ultimate accelerating full-size SUV, that would be the new absolutely bonkers version of the Escalade. That will go zero to 60 to around 4.4 seconds and the exhaust note really sounds incredible. 
but it is going to be significantly more expensive than any version of the Wagoneer or Grand Wagoneer at the moment. Logically, if you get the base 5.7 liter V8 engine, things are going to be a little bit slower, zero to 60, but in my unofficial testing at the launch of this out in New York, it was still posting times that were better than base versions of the Tahoe or the Yukon with GM's 5.3 liter V8. Even though this model has pretty wide tires on it, the laws of physics must be obeyed when it comes time to stop the vehicle, and it took 125 feet for this to stop from 60 miles an hour back to zero. That's pretty impressive, and that puts this sort of right between the Navigator and the Escalade. The Navigator, last time we tested it, took 130 feet, the Escalade 120 feet. But when it comes to handling, I like the way the Wagoneer and Grand Wagoneer feel. Now, I don't have access to a skid pad, but I know folks that do, and this has posted higher skid pad numbers than the Escalade. Interesting there that the braking scores are a little bit longer here because it seems to all be grip related. And I think what's going on is that the electronic nannies just let you have a bit more fun in the Wagoneer and Grand Wagoneer. The Escalade would probably handle just about as well without stability control, but it intervenes pretty aggressively if you start to push it a little bit harder. And this will allow you to have just a little bit more fun. Logically, of course, less fun than you'd be having in a Grand Cherokee L, but we're talking about two very different kinds of vehicles. This is a body-on-frame vehicle. The Grand Cherokee L is a unibody vehicle, so it's going to feel tighter, a bit more engaging, a bit more sporty, I guess you could say, versus the Wagoneer or Grand Wagoneer, which definitely have a more grown-up, more isolated, bigger, heavier feel to them. Out on a rougher road surface like the gravel road that I'm on here, ride quality is definitely very good. It does, however, fall below the new General Motors vehicles that have a combination of a ferromagnetic damper and an adaptive air suspension system. Those two vehicles are really interesting. The air suspension offers the height adjustability that you want in a full-size SUV, whereas the damping is handled mainly by the magnetic dampers. The combination gives a really, really smooth ride, and one that's a bit more like a crossover than a full-size SUV. This is a bit more truck, a bit more SUV-like, although it still has a good amount of polish to it. Thanks to the independent suspension in the rear, the suspension does not become upset over broken pavement or on longer stretches of rough roads like this, but it doesn't soak up as many of the bumps as well as the new Cadillac Escalade will, or even the Jeep Grand Cherokee L with the adaptive air suspension system. Versus the newest entry in this segment, the new Toyota Sequoia, this feels a lot more sorted, a lot more engaging when the road starts winding. The new Sequoia does not have an independent rear suspension, which surprised a lot of folks. The logical reason is that the Sequoia shares a bit more with the Tundra than this does with the Ram 1500 or the Escalade does with the Silverado 1500 for very similar reasons. They realize that SUV shoppers probably want a more civilized ride. They don't want the rear end to be skipping across broken pavement, etc. And the result is a much more sorted, much more stable button down vehicle. This vehicle's body on frame design and all the laminated glass really shows in the cabin noise score. I measured 69 and a half decibels in here tying this with the BMW X5 and some of the quietest vehicles that we've tested. It is worth noting, of course, that a lot of half-ton trucks are down here around 69 and half and 70 decibels for exactly the same reason. Having a separate body and a separate frame that are isolated from one another just makes for a quieter cabin, whether we're on a rougher road surface or a well-paved road surface, gravel roads, regular roads, etc., or importantly, whether you're towing a trailer or not. And that's gonna be one of the big differences between this and a Grand Cherokee L. And I would be talking Wagoneer versus Grand Cherokee L, of course. Now, when it comes to fuel economy, probably the less said about that, the better. The most efficient version of this is likely gonna be a future version of the short wheelbase model with the low output version of the inline six. It's probably gonna get around 21 to 22 miles per gallon. Some versions of the three liter inline six have already been EPA tested. They seem to be coming in around 20 to 21 miles per gallon combined or so. This particular model, not overly efficient with the 6.4 liter V8. Now, over a week of mixed driving, I have been averaging 16.5 MPG, which is interestingly just a little bit better than you'll get in a Durango with the 6.4 liter V8 engine. And I think the main reason is that this engine is more aggressive at shutting down cylinders. That's enabled by the design of this vehicle and the greater amount of isolation we have between the cabin and the frame of the vehicle where the engine is mounted. In the Durango, if it was more aggressive at shutting it down, you'd really be hearing those vibrations in the cabin. In here, there's more isolation and then there's more room on the frame to put the active shake weight things that they have that actually counteract the engine vibrations when it's in four cylinder mode. So the extra time that this spends in four cylinder mode is likely why fuel economy is pretty similar to a smaller, lighter vehicle with a similar engine under the hood. 
but you will find better fuel economy in some of the competition, most notably the diesels from General Motors, which you can get in the Cadillac Escalade. So when it comes to fuel economy, I'm going to have to give this a C. I'm a little surprised they haven't put a plug-in hybrid system in the Wagoneer and Grand Wagoneer, but it is likely coming. So if you wait long enough, it is pretty likely that we're gonna get some version of a four cylinder or a six cylinder drivetrain under the hood with a plug-in hybrid system at some point in the future. It's now time to give the Wagoneer and Grand Wagoneer a final grade. Where these vehicles really excel is the interior in terms of design and in terms of parts quality and refinement. They have done an absolutely excellent job with the interior, especially in the upper level trims. But I would also say that even the base Wagoneer feels very premium on the inside and that really sets it apart from the other base entries that you might be looking at as a value alternative to the Wagoneer and Grand Wagoneer. Keep in mind, this vehicle is not targeting the Sequoia or the Tahoe or the Armada. Instead, the Wagoneer and Grand Wagoneer both are really looking towards something like a Yukon Denali or the Escalade and the Navigator. Even though there is a less expensive version of this vehicle, the regular Wagoneer, it's still pretty expensive compared to some of those other alternatives, and the price tag escalates very rapidly. The 6.4 liter V8 engine is fantastic. The 5.7 can feel a little bit sluggish sometimes, but it is peppier than the base engines that we find in some of the competition. The roomy interior is really a big plus for the Wagoneer and Grand Wagoneer. Lots of third row room. Now you should know that if you get the Grand Wagoneer L, you don't get more third row room. The biggest downside for the Wagoneer and Grand Wagoneer for me is the styling on the outside. I wish it had been a bit more adventurous, a little bit more distinguished from the Grand Cherokee and Grand Cherokee L. The Grand Cherokee, Grand Cherokee L, Wagoneer, Grand Wagoneer, and the L versions of those all look pretty similar. They're kind of scaled models of one another. But then we have the peculiar body colored pillars, and I understand they wanted to make it stand out a bit. I don't really care for body color pillars. That is something you could fix, but you can't fix the fact that it really does look like an overinflated Grand Cherokee. Now, some people might like that, some people might not. Styling is a personal preference thing, but I do think that the Navigator and the Escalade are a little bit better differentiated, and I think that the Escalade is the best looking entry in this segment right now. Also, we have the mediocre fuel economy. There are rumors that we're going to get a plug-in hybrid version of the Wagoneer and Grand Wagoneer. I really hope that happens because it could change things in a positive direction. But right now, if you want better fuel economy, you're going to have to look towards the Escalade. It has an inline six turbo diesel. It is going to be more fuel efficient. Now, versus the mainline options, honestly, there's not a whole lot of difference between Wagoneer, Grand Wagoneer, the Expedition, the Escalade V8, etc. They're all going to be mediocre when it comes to fuel economy. That's a common pain point for these vehicles. Now, a little bit more important for some folks is going to be the early reports of glitchy infotainment systems. When Brian Ross Kelly, our other host in Atlanta, was driving one, he had some issues with the software. Uh, we reported those to Slantis. They said it seems to be some early production issues, but we have heard reports that other folks are having problems with it as well. Now, weird twist, they don't seem to affect other Uconnect 5 vehicles, so we don't know whether it's something that's just limited to this platform or whether it is something that has been fixed. Now let's roll through the pricing. For 2023, the Wagoneer starts at 58,995, the Grand Wagoneer at 88,640. So definitely a big steep bump there, but you do get the more powerful engine and a lot more feature content on the inside. The Grand Wagoneer tops out at 117,315 right now, and that is for the short wheelbase version. We're simply talking about short wheelbase vehicles on this pricing chart. You can see that although the base price is higher than something like a Tahoe or an Expedition, it is definitely less expensive than an Escalade, a Navigator, or an X7. And that's again because of this unusual positioning for this full-size SUV from Jeep. The Escalade starts at just under 80,000, so does the Navigator, so does the X7. And and if you want crazy pricing, that's definitely going to be found in the Escalade lineup. We have the Escalade V. It is definitely going to be more expensive than the Grand Wagoneer. But even the non-V version of the Escalade with similar content is going to be a little bit more expensive. And the Navigator, it's going to be right around the same price with a little bit of extra customization. I do like the black label package that we find in the Navigator at the moment. The X7 is going to be a little bit tighter in terms of turning diameter. It's going to be a little bit easier to park. It's going to be more engaging because it's a unibody SUV. And performance is going to be excellent in that X7 as well. 
But at the end of the day, it's not the same thing as the other three vehicles here. It's going to be significantly narrower across the second row and across the third row. It's not going to tow as much. It's not a body on frame SUV. If you're looking for that rugged capability of a frame underneath your next SUV, if you really want the widest second row, the biggest and roomiest third row available, the biggest cargo area, you're going to have to look at one of the now big three American full-size SUVs, either from Ford, from General Motors, or from the Stellantis Group. These are going to be the only options. And if I were shopping for one today, I would probably get the Wagoneer. Well, let me rephrase that. I would get the Grand Wagoneer because I do like the interior better. I don't know if I would get the passenger screen. I don't need that, but I am really interested in the twin turbo inline six. Again, stay tuned for that. The 6.4 liter V8, that's probably where I would go though. It's been reliable. It has a great sound to it and fuel economy. It's about the same as the rest of the competition. Now it would be a really, really tough call between that and the Cadillac Escalade. The Escalade has a slightly better ride quality. I like the design of the interior a little bit better, although the infotainment and electronic systems, I think, are better in the Wagoneer and Grand Wagoneer. But the Escalade has the single best feature in this segment, and that is Cadillac Super Cruise. You do find a hands-free system in the Lincoln. Theoretically, at some point, there will be a hands-free system in the Jeep. We don't see one at the moment. But Super Cruise is absolutely excellent. It's much more polished than the Active Glide system that we find in the Lincoln, also known as Ford's Blue Cruise. So if you're shopping for that kind of system, absolutely go with the Escalade. Be sure to let me know what you think about that and what you would pick if your cash was on the line. Find me over at Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all of those social places. And of course, stay tuned because I am going to be driving that new inline six very, very soon. See all of you later.